The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. See, when it comes to the words of Christ in any ministry out there, you have some who preach Christ, but you have some who preach their own ideologies. And the ones who preach Christ, you're going to see them pushed back, that they're going to be pushed back. First of all, the Lord said, the world seeks to kill Christ. It sought to kill him when it walked the earth. It's going to seek to do that today. Of him or anything he is in, the world is not going to embrace Jesus Christ. So if you find an element trying to snuff out the New Testament, then you know what spirit is operating by. You'll not know it any other way. That's how Satan works. It's very subtle, more subtle than any beast of the field. You're not really going to notice him come into the fold, but you will notice him in this one way that he does not want the gospel of Jesus Christ to be amplified by his own ideologies. And it's time to watch for these spirits. The world teaches a backward way. Many of you, when you first came to COT, you were against people. But what does the Bible teach us? We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, all these things. So the Bible teaches us our fight is not with our fellow man, but with the spirit behind the person. And how many of you have learned in life that if you get rid of that problem person in your group, your vicinity, another person comes with the same spirit and the work continues, that dark work, that division that they plant still continues. How many of you have noticed that? You can kick everybody out of your life. The Spirit's going to return through somebody each and every time because you're doing the opposite of what the Bible says. you got to catch this one point because what you'll end up doing is kicking everybody out of your life thinking that that's going to solve the problem when that Spirit just simply operates through somebody else. And then you'll kick them out of your life and then you'll kick the other person out of your life. In the meantime, you're doing the opposite of what the Word of God says to do. We weren't sent here to kick people out of our lives, but to kick these dark entities in the butt. That's what we're sent here to do. You are the opposition to darkness in this world, but the battle is not won by the eye. The eye sees flesh, not the spirit. That person through whom that spirit is operating, you're sent here to combat that spirit. You're sent here to overtake it, to boot it out of that person, that that person be free. That's the work that's being lost in this world. More and more people are targeting other people. They do so, and that's by flesh, not by the spirit. Haven't you noticed? And we'll lose this battle if it continues that way. The word still goes out. The word is still here. We have access to it. But you have a choice to believe the truth or to believe the hype. Given the severity of these escalations in the earth, I would hope that you would opt for the truth. The truth, as God always says, is revealed. It will not remain hidden from the saints. God releases the truth upon all who belong to him, even upon those who don't belong to him. So all of us will know. And when he reveals it, that's when you act on it. You'll never be in a position where you did not know. Don't let your life and the life you lived on this earth trick you into believing that somehow God will not have you equipped. Oh, yes, he will. But begin to walk steady in God's truth. Not going around cursing your fellow man, doing the opposite of what the Lord said to do. Because that's what's happening to a lot of people and they don't understand what they're doing to themselves. Somebody says, how do we boot out the spirit behind a person without, you know what, I have to tell you this. I encounter that just about on a weekly basis. There's always some spirit I have to contend with. I'll give you an example of one time. One time, I contended with a spirit that was nasty within a person. And I did not work this way at first. Because I too used to look at the person and say, what a loser that person is. You know what, that this person is that. You, you get overwhelmed, compromised internally and everything else. And um, I found myself against people. But all that died out when the Lord showed me the truth. And the truth was, if that person was not overtaken by a spirit, that person would not have those behaviors. That person will see things differently. Spirits will grab hold of your ears and your eyes, and they will control what you hear and what you see. It's easy to understand that, but that's a very basic principle. One of the first ones you need to understand. Spirits will control the way you hear and see. If you don't believe that, look at yourself in an argument. When you were trying to tell somebody something, you said one thing, but they heard something else. And the more you try to tell them that's not what you said, the more they get angry because they start hearing something else. 
I used to often get to the point and ask people, what are you hearing? What are you listening to? They'll make up facts. They'll say you said something you, that never came out of your mouth. And you'd be right there in front of the person. That's a good demonstration of how these spirits operate. Now, if a person is free from that, they can hear everything you say. They even have empathy. They have conviction. One of these negative spirits, they block out conviction. They block out and they pervert it. So anything that the Lord would give, they pervert. Once that spirit has a person where conviction would come, accusation comes. So they don't have conviction. They have accusation. But where you would attempt to pour out any type of love upon that person, they're going to perceive it as you just patronizing them or instigating something else in them. And if you would say a statement of care to them and say, hey, I really hope you make it. They'll say, oh, you're being sarcastic, huh? They, they, these spirits will control their hearing and pervert everything they hear. So talking to the person does no good. You cannot talk to the person to fix it. You have to pray. Talking to that person will only make it worse because every word that comes out of your mouth is going to be perverted in their hearing. They could swear by lie detect. They could take a lie detector test and they could pass that lie detector test with a lie. What I mean is this. If you told a person, hey, you know, you're a good friend. I like you and that. But that person didn't hear that. They heard that they were a sloppy friend and you hate them. They could take a lie detector test and they would pass that lie detector test because that's precisely what that spirit would have them hear. Now, if you approach that person with your mouth, everything you say is going to escalate the situation by prayer and by love and by forgiveness. That's how you win. That's how you can help free that person in the standard of Christ. You can't do it your way. I can't do it my way. You have to do it by the standards of Christ. And I'll be the first one to tell you that when you do it by the standards of Christ, you do not lose that battle. Not ever. But you will lose in every other way. I've seen people lose. They get to the point where they believe that God's word no longer works. And then when I hear them admit that, I'll say, no, it didn't work the way you want. You were trying to make it work. The, God's word is not a tool that you just throw out there like a wrench or a screwdriver for a screw, a, a, a wrench for a bolt. You don't do that. God's word is food for the soul of the one who would eat it. It's not something you use to elevate your own stature. You don't do that. Because you'll never know how to use it. First of all, when you forgive that person, that's almost like cutting a demon to pieces. Simple forgiveness. I mean real forgiveness. Forgiveness is not holding your tongue. That's not what forgiveness is. Holding your tongue is suppressing your own hatred or your own disgust you have internally. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is when they say something offensive and you hope for nothing for good for them. But see, to do this, you're going to have to first understand that you're confronting a spirit, not the person. Now, many of you, you may not have done this before. But what I'm telling you is this. When you're talking to a person, they begin to say all manner of things against you and they start hearing backwards. You're going to have to instantly discern, wait a minute, that's a spirit talking. So let me help you out on that. Here's how you know when it's a spirit. That person you know will utter something. That some other person who was overcome with anger and with darkness, they will utter something that person did, but they won't know each other. And what I'm telling you is that these spirits have the same phrases. They speak the same phrases. They speak the same accusations. Now that you know this, instead of you being surprised that this person said the same thing somebody said a long time ago, instead of you being surprised and shocked, now you know how to identify it. And in that moment, you got to realize that's not that person is in bondage. That person is dying. That person that just cursed you out, that person that just accused you. These spirits will always, if you start talking about anything that has to do with faith, they'll start making a joke about it. They'll mock it instantly. Now you know what you're doing. So you have to look at the person. You have to see the truth. The truth is that person is dying before you. They're overtaken by darkness in that moment. Should they stay in that condition, they will surely die. Forgive them because they truly have no idea what they're doing. In fact, haven't you gone back to the individuals? And sure enough, when you go back to them and you confront some of them, they'll say, well, I never said that. That's what they'll say. You'll say, well, yes, you did. No, I didn't. I never, never said that before. I never said that to you. It's almost like they can't remember in that moment what they're saying. Why? Because something has taken them over. You can also discern it in your own spirit when they take over. Because what happens to you is you'll feel this defensive wall. It's like an electric wall will be right in front of you. And if you're not careful, if you feed into that negative energy, you'll start balling up your fist. You'll find yourself in high aggression at that moment. That's the power of these tiny demons. No one's confronted the big ones yet. But that's the power of the tiny demons. When they get close to you, you can feel the fury in them. And if you're not careful, 
where your flesh begins to respond outside of you. If you give into it, you'll start saying things you wouldn't ordinarily say, bad things. Some of you have done this, and then after it was over, you sat down and said, oh, my Lord, why in the world did I say that? Well, that's what happens when you're under the influence of these things. You may not know this, but when you engage in an argument with somebody who's overtaken by one of these things, if you engage, you're going to join in with what they're operating by which is a spirit of accusation. And then both of you will begin to accuse one another. You can always foresee it. You can sense it first because it's almost like a, a weird type energy will hit you and nothing but accusation will enter into your mind against that person. Here's what happens once you defeat that. Once you defeat that and you forgive that person, that demon can no longer penetrate, that force can no longer penetrate and you'll have no accusation in your mind against them, but you'll have hope in your heart for them. And that's like cutting the neck out of a demon instantly. You begin to defeat him. And when they start saying these negative things, and in your heart, you're not saying a word, but you're hoping in your heart, Lord, release this person from this demon. The demon will begin to contort a bit because he cannot work unless you engage him. And many people don't know this. Unless you engage that person, unless you utilize the power of that demon, which is to accuse, to blame, to fault find, and all these things. If you don't use that, that demon will have to flee. I mean, they'll have to flee quickly. See, there's a, a heavenly law. But if a child of God is ever obedient, may God's power being already released will go instantly to work. This is all over the world. His power hovers, and should we be obedient, his power will be for us and not against us. That demon must flee because he'll be in contradiction of that law. And a demon cannot come against an obedient child and live. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It never said engage him. It never said try to outsmart him or try to outwit him. That's not what the word of God says. That's how you defeat it. But see, that comes by experience with the spirit. And I'm telling you, it happens that way every time before the Lord showed me this. I'd be drawn into every type of argument you could ever imagine. After the Lord showed me this, there was no drawing me into any argument. In fact, those same individuals would avoid me. That same spirit avoids me. It'll call me out too from people I don't know. It'll call you out too. In my case, for example, there'll be people, maybe they're riding a bike or something like that, and they'll stop, point straight at me and say, you're not kicking me out of my home today. And of course, I'll look around. Nobody will be around. You'll be pointing at me. And then I'll go to another state or something like that. The same thing is uttered. The exact same thing. So they will know who you are. Those entities will know who you are. Why? Because you're obedient. And when you're obedient, it's like you walking around with a big banner on saying, I'm a child of the Lord. And it's simply because you're obedient. They know they cannot get to you, but they will watch you because they want a way in. Here's the bad part, though, for a lot of folks. For a lot of folks, they've already found a way in. The people are not aware of that. What you see in the world right now with the immorality in the world, that's them. That's their influence in many people. Satan is the author of confusion. That's his fingerprint. You see that everywhere. Confusion. Confusion is nothing more than one opposing side. No one's agreeing on anything. Now look at the institutions around the world and what do you see? You'll see the Satan has infiltrated the areas we did not pray for. That's what you'll see. You're the ones who have the power to kick him out. But how many people actually prayed for the folks they blame things on in government? Let's face it, that's not what's happening. People are not praying for that opposing political figure. That's not what they're doing. They're joining sides with those that accuse them. And because they do this, that's like giving Satan authorization to turn everything upside down. Why do you think the beast comes into his moment when the falling away happens? Because Paul said that day shall not come unless there come a falling away. And then that man of perdition is revealed. Think about that. How can the man of perdition be? Why is he not revealed prior to the falling away? Because it would be too many saints being obedient to the Lord and Satan can operate in obedience because God is for you and not against you. And if you choose to obey his word, you enact heavenly laws upon this earth that Satan cannot penetrate. But if you're absent, if he can somehow trick you into doing the opposite of what God said, he's able to rule and reign in those areas that you are disobedient in. That's how he manifests. That's why you are the timing. That's why the living God said, when iniquity flourishes in the earth, that's the moment 
That's the timing. All the timing of the end times hinges upon iniquity rising in the earth. That's when the saints are no longer obedient. A great many of them, they're not obedient. That's when many are doing what they think they should do and not doing the righteous thing. God said, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for his name's sake. That's what he said, pray for them. But that's not what people are doing. They're not praying for them. They're accusing them, which allows Satan to operate. Because if where you fail to pray, if you fail to pray over something, you've left an area for Satan to go and disrupt. I'll give you guys an example. Now, I, I've said this before one time. You are a castle. Your body is that castle. You, the spirit, are inside that castle. In life, we often look out of the windows of our own castles and everybody else's castle. And we can see everything wrong with it with somebody else's castle. But we don't like people, people looking inside of our windows. This is the castle in which Christ will stand at the door and he knocks. Once you let Christ in, which a lot of you have, you've let him in, but he comes into the big forum, the place you occupy the most, and you let him go no further. There are countless rooms in your castle. You still have those doors shut. Maybe down the hallway is a door where you were offended when you were small and you have not forgiven in that area. You keep that door shut, Christ. There are areas you have long forgotten about. Now, just because you have forgotten about them does not mean they go away. So that means you let Christ in the form of that place, but you did not let him anywhere else. The rooms of your house are these places you confess unto him. They're the places you open. Here's what happens. Those areas that you have not let him in, in some of those areas, darkness does reside. Whether you know about it or not, it still resides. That's why you can be in the Bible. You can be lifted up in your heart and everything else. It takes one person to come in and push a button. And all your Bible study just went out of the window. You'll be instantly compromised of the flesh. Somebody know what I'm talking about. You can become instantly angered, instantly offended, instantly anything. Because these things know how to push the right buttons. They know what doors you have not opened. Because they are in those rooms. They know what rooms you've let Christ into. Because... They can't be there. But the doors you have shut, they're in there. And so they know what buttons to push on you every single time. And they will laugh at a saint spiritually, a saint that will not comply with the whole word of God, knowing that if they can push a button, all they have to do is wait. Wait until you really think you have made it. Wait until things are going right and you're truly blessed to push one of those buttons and to bring your whole castle down. That's what they wait on. And these are areas of life that we forget about. Now hear me on this. That's why self-reflection is so important. It's our responsibility to open up every single room and say, Lord, cleanse this room. The Lord stands ready at the door to clean up every single nook and cranny of that place. In those places that were once dark, they were so dirty and overwhelming, all we did was shut the door. He'll come in and clean up. Listen, your burden are those shut rooms. That's your heaviness. When you're heavy in this world, it's because you have shut something up in a room and you will not open the door. That's your burden, that's your heaviness. Like those people you have not forgiven. Like that one person that you know that you offended, but you never went back to make it right. See, there are certain things we can do too, and time is running out. Do you guys know that those people in the earth who chose against the Lord, all these disasters are coming for them. Darkness is coming for darkness. Darkness is not coming for light. All this negative stuff that's going to happen on the earth is going to be attracted to those who operate in darkness is coming straight for them. It is not coming for the righteous. I say that with boldness because I've been in the middle of a tumult and the tumult did not come for me. It passed me by. But there were some who could not run. Whatever it comes for, it will not miss. You guys have families and everything else. I always beg people. Because some people say, well, I, you know, I'm trying to believe all this stuff and I just, you know, I'm trying to make changes, but I can't seem to stay consistent with the changes. I give you a challenge. Those of you who have someone you love who have children in the home, take a look at your children. It's just like smoking a cigarette. How many people want to stop smoking cigarettes, right? You really love those in the household. Listen to me carefully. You've tried to stop and it didn't work. You prayed about it and nothing took place. You probably tried everything out there and just didn't work out for you. Let me ask you a few questions. Number one, would you lay down your life for those you love? Yes or no? If you say yes, then I have something else for you. Since you would lay down your life for those you love, start the process of laying down your life in this way. Look at those people you love. You're also a Christian, which means if another Christian sees you as a Christian, but they see you smoking, it can cause them to stumble. Do you hear me? If it causes them to stumble, I'm sure you don't want to do that in your heart, even with your own children. You don't want to represent smoking as being part of righteousness. You want all this man-made earth stuff. 
to be separated from righteousness so they'll have no problem. So look at them carefully. Look at your children. Contemplate them carefully. Contemplate those in the household carefully. If you want to stop smoking, look at them. They're your reason. When you can't muster enough strength to overcome the withdrawal symptoms for yourself, lay down your life for those around you. I've not met a person yet who could lay down their own lives for themselves. But I have met plenty who would give up everything for their own children, who would stop and cease from doing things to give their children a better chance in the future. I've met people that love other people so much that they will refrain from doing something simply out of love for the sake of the others. Don't do it for yourself. If you stop smoking for yourself, the reason is simply not big enough. But as a believer, you're made to lay down your life for others. So listen, because this is going to sound ironic, but put the cigarettes down for their sakes. I mean, clue you in on something. When you give up something for the sake of somebody else, your father is present in whatever you do like that. Your father will always be present in acts of real love. Not in this contrived stuff that we try to do, but in acts of real love. There are people out there now, they're engaged in a type sinful behavior. It's a habit to them, and they can't stop it. Look at those people you love and understand something. That that small thing you're doing could destroy them. It could mix them up. It could destroy them. You can find strength in those you love to overcome just about everything. Because your father is always bound to acts of love. Because God is love. You know when the Lord said, you didn't visit me in prison. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. You didn't give me something to drink when I was thirsty. And, and the people said, it was recorded. They said, well, when did we see you? And Jesus answered, what you have done to the least of these, you have done to me. In other words, for someone else's sake, when you feed them, you're feeding Christ. When you're clothing them, you're clothing Christ. Do you see that? When you do something for somebody else, that's why the Bible says, when you do something for somebody else, do as you would do unto the Lord. You know what that means? Understand that your doings are bound in love. If you do something unto the Lord, you're going to do that thing bound in truth and bound in love. The adversary is a slick one. And in the world, with all these habits and things that people have, they can't kick to the side. See, almost voices, you know, you got to do this for yourself and you got to stay healthy. That doesn't work. A saint is made to do what they do out of love for somebody else. One of the greatest commandments Jesus gave was what? Love your enemy as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because a lot of power is bound up in loving someone else just as you love yourself. And you may say, well, I don't love myself. Then why are you connected to the internet right now? Why, when you get cold, you go put clothes on? Why is it when you get hot, you take clothes off? Why, when your stomach starts growling, you go feed yourself? To love somebody else is just like that. But it is to consider them every time you do something. If you're hungry, do you consider your neighbor's hunger? When you're hurting, every time I, I like I have an injury, I'm always considering the injuries. So many injuries out there. I become very compassionate, not cruel upon other people with injuries. If I am sick, I'm always in regard of other people's sickness because I know what it feels like. When somebody's in an area where they're confused and they don't know what to do, I never chastise a person like that. I encourage them. When somebody's ready to give up on themselves, you don't go over there and shove the Bible down their mouth, but you consider the times when you were ready to give up. It takes experience to operate in compassion. And by the way, what do you think the Messiah has been giving you all this time? Experience. Experience comes by way of trials. You've been looking at your troubles as Satan attacking you. No, they have not been. They have been to give you experience that you may be compassionate upon everybody out there so that you could go forward with the work. If you have no experience, you can't relate. And if you can't relate, you're going to have a prescription for someone. You're going to have that, well, why don't you try this? See, when you have experience, you're not going to tell somebody to try something. That's when you mourn with them. That's when you sit in silence with them. That's when you know when to speak and you know when not to speak. That's what the Lord's been giving you. Something you asked for. Did, did you not ask, Lord, help me to help this person. Help me to help that person. Every time you do that, you go through something. And when you go through something, is so that you will be given or be empowered, anointed to help that person. You can't help a person if you have no idea what they're going through. You can give your prescription all day, give your recommendations all day. They mean nothing. We're sent here to actually connect to one another. We go through everything on this earth so that none of our doings will be in vain, but will be bound in truth and in love with great sincerity. That's what your trials are for. Who told you that the troubles in your life was Satan in the first place? 
when the Bible clearly tells us that we are to glory in tribulation, knowing what it works. I want you guys to think about something. With all the opposition you had in your life, how privileged were you that God would allow that to happen to give you experience to help somebody else out in the future? Everything, every situation that came into your life, didn't you meet somebody else who was torn by the same situation? And did you find out that, see, you tried to run, and when it came, you said, Lord, just take it away. God sent it, and then you asked God to take it away. You refused it. So for a lot of those trials and tribulations, you never gained experience. But then later on in life, you came across someone who needed your experience, and you were not able to give it to them because you dodged the trial. We murmured and complained. I don't know about you, but I came across some people like that in my life. And whenever a trial comes into my life, you'll never hear me say, Satan is after me or it's a trouble, do you? You don't hear that. In fact, nobody hears me complain. Not one soul on the earth hears me complain because I don't complain. There's nothing to complain about. I can see the truth of it. Everything I've gone through, someone needed. And you know what the Lord asks? Who's going to be educated? Who is it going to be? You know what he said in the Bible? Who shall I send? Whom shall I send? Who's going to go through the whole process to be of use to somebody in their tomorrows? Who's it going to be? There's a scripture in the Bible. There's a chapter that outlines this. Who is it going to be that I can give experience to? Why do you think in the Bible wisdom found no home? Wisdom came and tried to find a place among men and found nothing. Do you know why? Because every problem that comes, we think it's a problem. We don't understand. The Lord educates us in this reality. He will educate us. Have us go through things. It doesn't kill us. He has us go through it so that we can be qualified to be sent to others who will go through it. Many of you, you have an anointing. You just don't know it yet. Let me tell you how. When you were in trouble, no one came to your rescue. You felt abandoned. You were all alone. You were too young to defend yourselves or too weak to do anything about it. And you felt alone. You didn't even know that that's part of your anointing. To experience a breaking in your life, severe conditions, and you lived through it. it, you didn't die by it. And for years, you cursed the memory of it, not even knowing what it did. God brought darkness straight to your face, and you know what that type darkness does. You have the ability and the anointing to see that darkness wherever it is on the face of the earth. You are sensitive to it. Why did he do this? Because in your heart, you really do want to help somebody else. But you were not equipped to do it. And so guess what he did? Knowing that you, no, he already knew your heart, he put that heart in you. He equipped you before you had comprehension that you wanted to help somebody else. He equipped you with the ability to see a specific type of darkness that you may be of help to those who would come to the kingdom of God. Of course, he didn't send help your way because you had to go through the whole process. You had to see that darkness up close. You had to know what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it said, what it did, and everything. You know its behaviors. You know its language. You can spot it anywhere on the face of the earth. The one beside you can't do that. Your brothers and your sisters, they can't do that. Your friends, they can't do that. You can. The same ones. You're the same ones who had no help. You're the same ones nobody came to pull you out of that mess. You're the same ones that felt abandoned. And you had no idea. That's the anointing. Haven't you read the Bible? of the gentlemen who are anointed. What they either went through in the beginning or went through at the end. Either way, they go through something. You went through it. You were broken. Your flesh was broken. You were confronted by darkness because God knew you wanted to sincerely help some folks. And listen, there's no worse thing than this, than to have a heart to help someone and to have someone have something happen in their lives. And you have no idea what to say, what to do, or what to pray for. There's no worse position than that. The Lord knew your heart and he equipped you. Now you're anointed. So listen to me. Get out of the offense. Get out of the mindset that that thing happened to you and it was unfair and it was this. Now you know what it was for. Don't sit there like a victim. No, you've been empowered to see what hardly anybody else can see. And it really is time for you to go to work. It's time for you to show up for somebody else. Nobody showed up for you because you had to go through the whole process. But there are other people out there praying. Some of you have passed a child. And you looked in that child's eyes and you could see them screaming out, help me. You could see it. You could hear it. They were saying, help me. But you had no boldness in you on confusion. Now you know what your past was for. Some of you men out there, you were broken into a thousand pieces when you poured your life into somebody. They turned and walked away and left you with a mess to straighten up. There are other broken men out there. They're broken to the point of suicide. 
You know the language of a broken man's heart. Now you know what to pray for. And you too, you had no boldness. Ask the Lord for boldness. That you may be able to walk in his ways without regard of how you're going to look or what somebody else will say. That his work be done in you. That's the boldness. When the disciples prayed for boldness in the Bible, they didn't pray for boldness that they would speak louder. They prayed for boldness that the work of the Lord would not be altered within themselves because there was intimidation all around them. And they needed boldness to stay on course. And God gave them boldness so that despite what came against them, they stayed on course with what the Lord gave them. They weren't loud. They weren't outspoken. They kept the truth. They didn't change the truth because of intimidation around them. That was boldness. It's not about being loud and yelling and all this. That's not what it's about. That boldness was a boldness to keep the word of God sacred, true, and to keep it righteous. Some of you may have, oh, what do I do when I see that little girl going by? Do I confront the guy? No, you pray. Listen, cover this entire earth with your petition to the Father. You have that right through Christ to go bold to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. And when somebody's crying out, that certainly is a time of need. You have that right. Do you see the impact you've been sent here to make? To undo the darkness in somebody else's life. To have understanding. It's just about everything. Once you have understanding, you identify. You go to battle with those spirits and you're victorious in Christ. Obedience assures the victory. Now do you see why we shouldn't go around cursing everybody, accusing everybody, but truly going to battle for everybody? Our Father is no respecter of persons. Neither should we be. This is your time. And when the world is going upside down, when science is about to be turned on its head, when the unexplainable takes place, people are going to become desperate. And you've been sent here to receive the ones that will be displaced. The Lord does that. He will utilize everything in your life for his sovereign work, because all of you are vessels of usage. But for those who don't quite understand, they criticize. It's natural when you don't understand something. If I were to approach you, and let's say I had no understanding, and you were just simply fed up with life, and I had no understanding, what I would do, if I had no understanding, I would say, well, just read this scripture, and you're going to be okay. You know why I would say that? Because that's all I know. You guys will encounter others just like that. Don't get angry at them. You're going to notice people doing the best they can with somebody else. And they're always going to tell somebody to read a scripture or just pray about it. And the Lord's going to fix it because that's all they know. Don't criticize them for that. But in that moment, thank God that he took you through the ringer. Thank God he took you through the mud. The key word here is he took you through. No situation in your life took you out of this world. You're, you're still right here. You're here for a reason. You're highly purposed. You couldn't be destroyed because God purposed you to survive all this time to be of help to the ones that will be here. See, a lot of people are not going to be able to help the folks that are coming in the fold today, but you will. And for the person who says, go and just read a scripture, that's all they know to do. Don't criticize them for that, but rather be thankful that the Lord took you through every single piece of your life. And let me clue you in, the more painful your life was, the more of an anointing you're going to have. You'll do the impossible. This race that we're in, it's not for those who are trying to win the race. This race is won by those who want to see others win the race. When you have a desire to see somebody else have the victory, when you want their freedom to be like your freedom, the Lord will instruct. Do you see what your life has been about? It's not been a total loss. You're not behind the power curve. You haven't been left behind or anything else. No, you've been fine-tuned to do something very rare in these last days. God has his people everywhere. All of you have a calling. All of you are purposed. And it takes a lifetime of training to get you where you should be. A lifetime of experience. There are lots of things you have to endure and encounter. And it comes with a lot of pain. But all of it's for the glory of the kingdom. God has his children everywhere. And as they begin to realize and obey the Father, so he dispatches them in their respective callings. Nobody was ever meant to retire in the pews. There's no work in the pews. The work is among the people, not in the pews. Some of you in your local churches, you left your local church because you saw corruption in it, but nobody else did. Now, why do you think you saw the corruption in that church and nobody else could? Because you were sent there to make a difference and to go to battle. That's why. You, were, you weren't sent there to go run away. No, 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 no. You were sent there to pray. I don't know if you know this or not, but God doesn't hear the cry of a heathen. God hears your cry. 
God moves based on what you pray for. Do you know that? I know it's difficult to believe, but he has empowered you to be an observer here. And what you say to him means everything. You are the body. You're the ones that have direct contact with this world. The Father does not have direct contact with this world. He would consume it by his goodness. All darkness would be gone. But God, through his mercy, has put you here. You're the body, the moving elements of something very real. And what you say means everything. Why do you think God teaches us not to accuse? Not to waste our time doing that. All that stuff's a waste of time because it does not make change. God does everything for a purpose. Everything is done for a purpose. You're here for a high purpose. You're here to exact change. You're here to be victorious. He's already empowered you over all darkness. If that were not so, the darkness in your life would have killed you. Satan would rather have you destroy those of you who continue to have faith in Christ. He'd rather have you killed than anything else. But he has no power to destroy you. And every trial that you've ever been under has been under the watchful eye of a caring father. Because you have a role to play right now. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.